This is Ray Mosholder with a full report on Ukraine for Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. And just a note to make it clear. If you find me repeating myself at any point in this broadcast, please forgive me. You can imagine how many sources I've gathered news from to make this report meaningful to you. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky warned his people early Saturday that retreating Russian forces were creating a complete disaster outside the capital as they leave landmines across the whole territory, even around homes and corpses. He issued the warning as the humanitarian crisis in the encircled city of Maripol deepened, with Russian forces blocking evacuation operations for the second day in a row, stopping the Red Cross from helping the people, while the Kremlin accused the Ukrainians of launching a helicopter attack on a fuel depot on Russian soil. Ukraine denied responsibility for the fiery blast, but if Moscow's claim is confirmed, it would be the war's first known attack in which Ukrainian aircraft has penetrated Russian airspace. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said five weeks after Moscow began sending upwards of 150,000 of its own troops across Ukraine's border, quote, certainly this is not something that can be perceived as creating comfortable conditions for the continuation of the talks. Zelensky said in his nightly video address to the nation, they are mining the whole territory in Maripol. They are mining homes, mining equipment, even the bodies of people who were killed. There are a lot of tripwires, a lot of other dangers. He urged residents to wait to resume their normal lives until they're assured that the mines have been cleared and the danger of shelling has passed. While the Russians kept up their bombardment around Kiev and Chernev, Ukrainian troops exploited the pullback on the ground by mounting counterattacks and retaking, retaking a number of towns and villages. Western officials and analysts were initially skeptical, suspecting the Russians were simply repositioning and resupplying for new attacks. While that may still be true, the Russian pullback from the Kiev area after more than a week of Ukrainian counterattacks appeared to be real. These officials and analysts said, based on Ukrainian military accounts of retaken towns and other signs, including social media videos and satellite images pointing to a Russian retreat. The counterattacks probably prompted the Russian decision to give up on Kyiv, said Frederick W. Kagan, a military expert with the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. He said the counterattacks demonstrated that the Russians were actually not going to be able to hold the positions they occupied anyway. Still, Ukraine and its allies warned that the Kremlin is not de-escalating to promote trust at the bargaining table, as it claimed 
but instead resupplying and shifting its troops to the country's east. Those movements appear to be preparation for an intensified assault on the mostly Russian-speaking Donbass region in the country's east, which includes Maripol. Zelensky warned of difficult battles ahead as the Russians redeployed troops. He said, quote, we're preparing for an even more active defense. He didn't say anything about the latest round of talks, which took place Friday by video. At a round of talks earlier in the week, Ukraine said it would be willing to abandon a bid to join NATO and declare itself neutral, Moscow's chief demand in return for security guarantees from several other countries. Maripol, the shattered and besieged southern port city, has seen some of the worst suffering of the war. Its capture would be a major prize for Russian President Vladimir Putin, giving his country an unbroken land bridge to Crimea, the part of Ukraine that Russia seized in 2014. Vladimir Fesenko, head of the Ukrainian think tank Penta, said Maripol's fate could determine the course of the negotiations to end the war. In Fesenko's words, Maripol has become a symbol of Ukraine, and without its conquest, Putin can't sit down at the negotiating table. The fall of Maripol, he said, will open the way to a peace agreement. On Tuesday, the International Committee for the Red Cross said it was unable to carry out an operation to bring civilians out of Maripol by bus. It said a team had been on its way but had to turn back. A Red Cross statement read, For the operation to succeed, it's critical that the parties respect the agreements and provide the necessary conditions and security guarantees. City authorities said the Russians were blocking access to Maripol. Still, 3,000 residents of Maripol somehow managed to flee by automobile or bus, but the vast majority were still stuck after the Red Cross judged the exodus too dangerous. By some estimates, three-quarters of Maripel's population has fled, and roughly 100,000 people remain. The Red Cross had expected about 54 buses, along with an unknown number of private vehicles, to take part in an evacuation convoy carrying thousands of people. While the larger convoy failed on Friday, smaller groups of people have been able to leave this city in cars, according to local officials. On Friday afternoon, Ernia Verishuk, the Deputy Prime Minister, confirmed in a statement on her Telegram page that a corridor had opened from Maripol to the city of Zavrzina by private transport. Around noon on Friday, Piatur Andrushenko the Maripol mayor's advisor said that some buses had left for nearby Burdyanks. By day's end, it remained unclear exactly how many people from Maripol had been able to leave. 
But Krilo Tymoshenko, a top aide to President Vladimir Zelensky, said on his Telegram account that roughly 3,000 people had managed to escape and that more than 3,000 had been evacuated from other cities. Now, if those figures are true, there are still 100,000 people stranded in Maripol. The suspended Red Cross evacuation in Maripol, a city that has come to symbolize the horrors of the war in Ukraine, was among several developments pending a mixed picture on Friday as one of the biggest armed conflicts to convulse Europe in decades rumbled in to its sixth week. Petro Andriyoshenko, an advisor to the mayor of Maripol, wrote on the Telegram messaging app, We don't see a real desire on the part of the Russians and their satellites to provide an opportunity for Maripol residents to evacuate territory controlled by Ukraine. He said Russian forces, quote, are categorically not allowing any humanitarian cargo, even in small amounts, into the city. Bombardment and street fighting have caused severe shortages of water, food, fuel, and medicine. Red Cross spokesperson Ewan Watson said, we're running out of adjectives to describe the horrors that residents in Maripol have suffered. On Thursday, Russian forces not only blocked a 45-passenger bus convoy attempting to evacuate people from Maripol, they seized 14 tons of food and medical supplies bound for the city. Zelensky said he discussed the humanitarian disaster with French President Emmanuel Macron by telephone and with the President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, during her visit to Kyiv. Zelensky said Europe doesn't have the right to be silent about what is happening in our Maripol. The whole world should respond to this humanitarian catastrophe. Elsewhere, at least three Russian ballistic missiles were fired late Friday from the Crimean Peninsula at the Odessa region on the Black Sea. The Ukrainian military said the Iskander missiles were intended for critical infrastructure but didn't hit their targets because of Ukraine's air defense forces. It was unclear where they hit. Marchenko said there were casualties but <clears throat> he didn't elaborate. Odessa is Ukraine's largest port and the headquarters of its navy. As for the fuel depot explosion, Russian Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Kineshevev said two Ukrainian helicopter gunships flew in extremely low and attacked the civilian oil storage facility on the outskirts of the city of Belgorod, about 16 miles, 25 kilometers, from the Ukraine border. The regional governor said two workers at the depot were wounded, but the Rosneft State Oil Company denied anyone was hurt. Oleski Danilov, Secretary of Ukraine's National Security Council, said on Ukrainian television 
for some reason, they say that we did it. But in fact, this does not correspond with reality. Russia has reported cross-border shelling from Ukraine before, including an incident last week that killed a military chaplain, but not an incursion of its airspace. Amid the Russian pullback on the ground and its continued bombardment, Ukraine's military said it's retaken 29 settlements in the Kyiv and Cherniv regions. Russian forces in the northeast also continued to shell Kharkiv and in the southeast sought to seize the cities of Papazna and Rubezina, as well as Maripol. Meanwhile, Russia on Friday began its annual spring conscription, which aimed at drafting up to 134,500 men for a one-year tour of military duty. Russian officials say new recruits won't be sent to the front lines or hot spots, but many young Russians are skeptical and fear they will be drawn into the war. On the outskirts of Kiev, where Russian troops have withdrawn, damaged cars line the streets of Irpin, a suburban area popular with young families, now in ruins. Emergency workers carried elderly people on stretchers over a wrecked bridge to safety. Three wooden crosses next to a residential building that was damaged in a shelling marked the graves of a mother and son and an unknown man, a resident who gave her name only as Leela, said she helped hurriedly bury them on March 5th, just before Russian troops moved in. She said they were hit with artillery and they were burned alive. An urban resident who gave his name only as Andre said the Russians packed up their equipment and left on Tuesday. The next day they shelled the town for close to an hour before Ukrainian soldiers retook it. Andre said, I don't think this is over. They will be back. New signs emerged that Russian forces stymied by their own botched planning and fierce Ukrainian resistance were retreating from areas outside of Kiev, the capital, and moving north. Ukrainians asserted that they had retaken control of more than two dozen suburban towns and hamlets. Even as Russian forces pull back from Kiev and northern areas, quote, in the east of our country, the situation remains extremely difficult. The Russian militaries are being accumulated in Donbass in the Kharkiv direction. They're preparing for new powerful blows. We're preparing for even more active defense. Ukrainian officials were initially evasive about whether Ukraine's forces had carried out the assault. But a top security aide, Oliski Danilov, issued what amounted to a denial by saying this does not correspond with reality. Whether or how Russia intended to respond remained unclear, but the attack didn't appear to bode well for diplomacy to halt the war. Russia's Deputy Permanent Representative 
at the United Nations, Dmitry Polinsky told reporters that such attacks, quote, reflect the real intentions of the Ukrainian side and real intentions toward peace talks. Concerns about possible radiation exposure from the Russian seizure of Ukraine's Chernobyl nuclear plant, where a 1986 meltdown caused the worst radiation accident in history, surfaced again on Friday. In remarks by Rafael Mariano Grossi, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Nuclear Monitor. The Russians took control of the Chernobyl area last month and withdrew this week. While Mr. Grossi told a news conference at the agency's headquarters in Vienna that radiation levels hadn't changed at the plant. He said heavy military vehicles had stirred up contaminated ground when Russian forces first invaded the area. And apparently this might have been the case again on the way out. Mr. Grossi said that he was aware of reports that some Russian military personnel had been poisoned by radiation while they held the Chernobyl plant, but that the subject had not been discussed during talks he held in Russia with nuclear officials. Outside Ukraine, nations that have sought to penalize Russia by banning purchases of Russian oil, took further steps to help insulate themselves from the economic shock of higher oil prices caused by the reduced supply. The International Energy Agency, a 31-member group of oil-consuming nations, said they'd agreed to a new release of emergency oil reserves in what's turning into a historic, wide-reaching effort to calm global markets. The move came a day after the Biden administration announced the 180 million barrel release over six months from the strategic reserve held by the United States. The Pentagon on Thursday provided Congress with details of $300 million in security assistance it will be providing to Ukraine. The military equipment and weapons will be provided through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which is a program that allows for goods to be purchased through commercial vendors rather than be provided from existing United States military stocks. Peace or war is at stake, streams the headline in the tabloid Metropole, handed out to morning commuters flocking through the western station in Budapest. And there's a neat blue cross in the box next to the peace option. That's the slogan of Victor Orban's Fidesz party as it battles to win a record fourth consecutive term in office in elections on Sunday. After 12 years in power, they face their first genuine challenge from an opposition alliance of six parties that is united under one candidate, Peter Markeze, and Russia's war on Ukraine has given added impetus to the race. Hungary, 
shares a border with Ukraine and has taken in more than half a million refugees so far. Mr. Arbin insists that by helping the people but refusing to supply weapons to Ukraine, only he can keep Hungary out of the war. Viktor Orban's party slogan has been peace or war. His party's slogan of peace or war may be simplistic, but it's effective. And it is broadcast, printed, and lit up in bright letters wherever you look in Hungary. The government has spent eight times more on its campaign than all the opposition parties combined, according to a group of monitoring organizations. It helps that the ruling party has the support of a largely plant media. The opposition's catchphrase, on the other hand, is Orban or Europe. Their candidate, Peter Marquise, argues that Hungary should join Poland, the UK, and others in supplying arms to Ukraine. And if called upon, and only within a NATO framework, should even consider sending troops. The opposition complains that Fidesz has isolated Hungary from the European mainstream, from consensual democracy, fairness, and decency, and that in this war, Mr. Orban has even alienated Hungary's closest allies, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia, the other members of the Visegrad Four group. A V4 defense ministers meeting was abruptly canceled this week with the Czech defense minister accusing Mr. Orban of valuing Russian oil of Ukrainian blood. But it was Vladimir Zelensky whose message hit home hardest. He said in an address to the Danish parliament, there can be no Russian branches in Europe that divide the EU from within. This must stop and Europe must stop listening to the excuses of Budapest. Hungary gets 85% of its gas and 64% of its oil from Russia through a pipeline that deliberately circumvents Ukraine. However, a Hungary-Russia deal to expand the Pax nuclear power station south of Budapest with Russian finance and technology looks increasingly jeopardized by the war. And with Hungary's election campaign reaching its peak, President Zelensky chose the recent EU summit to address a very personal message to Mr. Orban. He said, listen, Victor, do you know what's going on at Maripol? And you hesitate whether to impose sanctions or not. And you hesitate whether to let weapons through or not. And you hesitate whether to trade with Russia or not. There's no time to hesitate. It's already time to decide. Mr. Zelensky also made a poignant reference to Budapest's famous shoe monument on the banks of the Danube, which are sitting next to me now. He said, look at those shoes and you'll see how mass killings can happen again in today's world. That's what Russia is doing today. 
the 60 pairs of brown shoes is in memory of Hungary's Jews murdered and pushed into the river by Hungarian fascists in the winter of 1944. Days after his speech, Ukrainians in Budapest arranged new shoes among the bronze ones on the Danube embankment, decorated with flowers and the blue and yellow ribbons of the Ukrainian flag. In memory of all the dead in Maripol and elsewhere in Ukraine, victims of the Russian invasion. The idea that Hungary is isolated from an otherwise pro-Ukraine Europe is an argument the government's side bitterly rejects. Mr. Orban told his final campaign rally, if the opposition wins on Sunday, the next day, they will start delivering weapons to Ukraine and close the taps on the Russian gas pipelines. Our heart is with the Ukrainians, but Hungary has to stand up for its own interests. This is ridiculous. I'm going to close with this retired General David Petraeus called the barraged Ukrainian city of Maripol, that country's Alamo, saying the United States could help provide game-changer loitering munitions to the Zelensky administration. Petrius, a former CIA director, told the story on Friday that the West has been providing key assistance to the country as Russia's invasion moves into its third calendar month. He said the United States should be pressing for Ukraine to get hold of switchblade drones, which he described as an aerial self-destructing munition that a soldier launches from a tube then directs to a target within a 15 to 30 minute travel range. The switchblade then flies itself into the target and explodes. We ought to be getting thousands of those to Ukraine, he said, adding that the United States initially provided a small amount to Zelensky's force. Those could be game changers. Those could really augment these counterattacks by the Ukrainian forces as they push further out of Kyiv, as they push further out of Kharkiv, as they oppose the Russian forces that are trying to push out of the southeast and also trying to entrap some of the Ukrainian forces that are defending it against that push out of the southeast. So I think that's again the sense, the origin, the catalyst for this urgency. I agree with it. I've been a commander. You never have enough. You're always asking for more. And I think everyone is doing everything they can to provide that. And that includes our NATO allies, Germany, on the cusp of providing an extraordinary amount of money and also of weapons and assistance. Patriots said the decimated city of Maripol harkens back to a fortification from the Texas Revolution. In 1836, Texan forces, which included famous frontiersman, Congressional Representative Davy Crockett, held off Mexican troops under General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana until essentially 
the last man. Patriots continued, there's the concern about the Southeast, the Russians helping the separatists push out from the so-called Donbass, and then also ultimately eventually are going to take Maripol, which has become the Ukrainian Alamo, fighting to the last defender, occupying lots of Russian battalions. But when that does eventually fall, those Ukrainian forces will be freed up, which explains Ukraine's urgency. This is Ray. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we pray again for Ukraine. We can't imagine the horror, the terror, the bombs, the, the, the possibility of nuclear war. God, help that helpless country that is so brave and so defending itself that it causes everyone to take a deep breath and say, could I possibly do what they're doing? Lord, we may have to, unless you stop the Putin regime. And if you stop those who surround him, who applaud him, who won't even tell him the truth. God, we thank you that you're in charge. You're the commander-in-chief. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for praying with me. This is a terrible time for Ukraine, and I pray that this will not be a terrible time for the rest of the world as well.